So let me introduce our uh, esteemed panel uh, as we sort of wrap up the day today. First, right here we have Alvin Soli, who is the director of the uh, Center for Family Strengths here at the University of Houston downtown. Give Alvin a big hand. He's done everything today. Next to him is uh, Eileen Giardino. Some of you just saw her in a presentation. She's Associate Professor of Nursing, UT Houston, uh, and she's a mainstay here in the community. Please give her a big hand. Uh, Mandy Kimball, some of you saw her earlier. Mandy is the Director of Public Policy and Government Affairs at Children at Risk, and she is the architect of many successes for children in Austin. Give Mandy a big hand. And the joining us also is Lawrence Thompson, who is the Director of Therapy and Psychological Services at the Children's Assessment Center here in Houston. Give Lawrence a big hand. <laughs> uh, let me start, guys. Uh, and first of all, I can't really see the audience really well, but I would love to entertain questions from you guys as well. So if there's questions after someone answers one of them, please just try to get our attention because I do want to get some questions from you guys. And we'll save a little bit of time uh, towards the end also just to, for me to walk out of the audience and get your questions. But let me start, uh, just a general question for all of you. As we talk about parenting, you know, it's interesting that, we, we, and I talked a little bit about this at lunch, that there's this whole idea of a nanny state. You know, is the state going to take care of all of our needs around parenting? Is it something that we should be looking for? So as we look at public policy and parenting, where, where is that separation between the government doing too much or the government doing the things that need to be necessary in, re, in regards to parenting uh, and public policy around parenting? Can I, and Eileen, can I start with you? Well, I think regarding parenting, we all know that uh, it's very important that the parents are incredibly involved. There's, there's better outcomes when parents are involved with uh, all aspects of their kids' lives. But there's also a time when we need I think at least that, that parents, individual parents, need some help and support from outside agencies or outside um, help from, you know, outside of their house. Um, from the perspective of young parents, a lot of times young parents, and I know this just from a, a medical perspective, that a lot of times young parents don't know what to do. They don't know how to parent. They don't have the support of parents or grandparents. And so um, in that case, I'm not sure I'm answering exactly what it's you're okay. asking, but I think that there is the need for um, other people to be helping. We all know that, that there's a need for other people to help. And whether those other people are um, part of um, programs that are involved in the community, certainly that, that helps. We all know that, or I should say that there, there is nurse visiting programs that have been found to be very effective and the, the focus of the nurse visiting programs is that while the mom, a pregnant mom, while the mom is pregnant, and then after she delivers, that there is someone who, a nurse who comes to the house, or there are also lay home visiting programs where there's somebody who comes to the house, interacts with the parent, gives them some advice, gives them some medical help, gives them all of the, some input that they wouldn't normally have. And the outcomes when those, of those people who are involved in the home visiting programs are incredibly better than those who aren't. So if you, you know, when they do studies to see are they effective, what they found is that the home visiting programs are very effective. They help decrease abuse, they help decrease uh, neglect, they help, help in all different ways. So I would say yeah. there is definitely uh, the need uh, when it's needed. Obviously, if somebody has a great support systems at home and they don't need that, that's great. But then for people who do, that, that there is the time for outside, whether you say government or uh, organizations to help with the parenting process. Th thanks. Uh Mandy, talk a little, Eileen, Dr. Giardino is talking about this fine line between uh, when the government needs to help and maybe when, when most of us don't expect the government to help. Where do you, in Austin, where do you find that that fine line is? Because there are probably sure. people pushing that all over the place. Well, and, and I think that Texas is very far 
from being a nanny state. Mm -hmm. um, and I think what's it's sort important, of the opposite almost, right? Yeah, absolutely, yeah. almost almost the opposite from from my perspective. Um, I think what's important is that in regards to public policy, we need to focus on those policies that support parents. And I think right now the majority of children, nearly 50% of the children in Texas are living at or near that poverty level. So making sure that policies are in place to support the parents, so it's not crisis mode. So it's, yes, I can go to work and have a safe environment for my kids. Yes, um, I can have health care for my kids. Yes, um, we won't experience food insecurity mm -hmm. and my kids won't go hunger. I mean, those, we need to take care of the, of the basics for our kids and families so that they can move forward. Um, I think education has a lot to do with it. So education for parents, the more educated you are, the better um, parent you can be, the more resourceful you can be. Um, but then also just because you have a high school degree or a PhD doesn't mean that you're prepared for um, being a parent, right? And I think that you mentioned mm -hmm. it earlier today, we have um, birthing classes, we have um, breastfeeding classes, but everyone assumes that you are um, going to be a great parent. They don't offer that information to you, except in Texas, except if you're on Medicaid. So basically, there's an assumption there. Um, there needs to be some awareness around that where if, if, if it's low-income families, well, then we'll give you some information. Um, but all parents and all children are at risk. So there's a yeah. lot of need around that. Uh, there's another microphone, isn't there? Some, is one, are one of you sitting? Oh, you have it. Okay, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Lawrence, and, and your fine line is sort of completely different. You're in an area that absolutely needs uh, government involvement because you're dealing with a lot of abused children. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the key components to this conversation is um, us being able to expand our definition, um, even of parent. Um, what constitutes a parent um, in that work with abused children um, coming from families that um, is done at the Children's Assessment Center where I work at, um, many times um, the caregiver is not um, that traditional uh, parent. So what does that mean for all these supports and interventions that we have in place in a standard way um, for a more traditional um, family. Uh, what does it mean when the kid's with a foster fam family? Uh, what does it mean when the child is um, um, at a residential treatment uh, facility and those people there uh, become their parents? Um, what it ends up meaning a lot of times is that that kid has got a harder, um, a harder, uh, harder challenge um, in front of them in terms of um, succeeding, um, whatever that means for them. And so as we're figuring out how to strengthen supports for children in our community, us really thinking about um, those abused, neglected um, children that a lot of times slip through the cracks uh, because they sometimes aren't as much of uh, these types of conversations um, as they should be. And um, of course, they're just as needy and vulnerable um, as a kid coming from any family. Alvin, when you, as you study, uh, you in the center study this whole idea of macro involvement around parenting. I mean, where do you find that 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 line between a nanny uh, nanny state and a state that needs to be involved in creating that safety net? Yeah, uh, I think that's a really good question. But I'm going to start with me, okay? okay. <laughs> Given the political climate, uh, I'm going to take a very conservative approach, and I'm going to say uh, self-disclosure. I pay north of 20 percent income tax, and I am very concerned about where my tax dollars go. And the way that relates to parenting and, and family education is that I know that when a child is not able to stay in their own home, if there's neglect or abuse, that eight professionals normally get involved, attorneys, social workers, supervisors, uh, court-appointed uh, special advocates, etc. So a lot of money goes into that. Uh, another area that I think is real important and from my history is that, again, from a kind of a personal perspective on it in terms of policy, is I worked, uh, my, one of my first jobs was working in an institution with per, for persons with mental retardation. And what we did is we tried to keep kids, young people, out of that institution. So we did family education groups with 
uh, parents, and as you know, mental retardation is not related to income. So we had a number of military wives. This was uh, in Tucson, which was a, had a fairly large um, Air Force base. Uh, military wives that had given birth late in their years and were more prone to uh, having children with mental different forms of mental retardation. So they came and they were having trouble coping with some of the kids' behaviors, and we were able to use uh, peers as well as professional input in working with them to help them look at uh, real basic hands-on things they could do day-to-day -to -day with their children and even adult children in their home. And so I think, you know, from a conservative point of view, prevention makes sense in terms of dollars and cents. So when you say nanny state, I think it's like that oil commercial, pay me now or pay me later. And when we pay later... That's a real old commercial, Alvin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> I still have oil in my car. <laughs> when, uh, and w when we pay later with institutions, whether it's uh, juvenile justice facilities, prisons, uh, mental health facilities, it's much, much more expensive. Why, why do you think that is, Alvin, that um, when we talk about it as public policy, people don't want to look at long term? I mean, you and I, we've seen all the evidence that shows that uh, parenting education, uh, getting the community involved, and having sort of public policy around this really pays off. Why, why do you think people don't want to pay attention to that, or our political leaders don't want to pay attention to that, that they're only looking at the short term? Well, I, I think it's like a lot of our society. We look very short term, and you have to get elected in two years or four years at the most. If you're in the Senate, that means in Texas you only have two legislative sessions, so you don't have much time. The other thing is, I mean, no one puts a plaque on a family education program or going into a home. You know, we put plaques on buildings, and so uh, I often have my students when they first come into the program say, I want to build an orphanage, and I cringe, because that's not what we want to do. We want to provide services to people and try to keep families together. So I think there's part of that is that prevention is hard to, to really get much traction, because you're preventing something rather than curing something. So we sometimes see the medical model played out and that you know if we're able to cure certain number of people from child abuse or substance abuse, that has more traction politically mm -hmm. than saying we prevented something from happening. Dr. Giardino, uh, earlier I went to uh, Jay Mendoza's presentation on uh, childhood obesity, and uh, one of the things he talked about is that a lot of times uh, people look at childhood obesity and they say, uh, you know, it's, it's up to that child and their parents' responsibility for that child not to be obese. But he talked about sort of the community, uh, the community's responsibility around creating an environment in which a kid can be, you know, an environment where they can be more active, an environment where they uh, are in uh, an area where they can eat healthily, there's encouragement to eat healthily as opposed to just eating whatever. And when we're talking about health, how do we as a community work to create that environment that's better for children so that they can be healthy and so that families and parents have an easier time raising a healthy child? Well, when it comes to health and children, there's a lot of factors that come into play. And even around obesity, um, if, if a community is not healthy, if a community has a lot of crime, if a community has a lot of um, lack of supports, then kids aren't outside, they aren't, they aren't doing things that, that help keep them healthy. So that's one aspect of it, that the communities themselves have to be healthy in order for the kids within the community to be healthy. When it comes to um, childhood obesity and other kinds of healthy behaviors, a lot of that really does have to be promoted by the, the families in, in which they live. And, um, you know, unfortunately in our society right now, there, there is a lot of poor eating habits, poor eating, poor um, health habits. As much as there are good ones, there's also a whole, you know, the whole aspect of those, those habits are, are on the downswing. So in terms of what we can do about it, I think it has to come from 
and I'm not sure I'm answering this question appropriately, but it has, in order for children to be healthy, the community, the, the parents have to be healthy and the community has to be healthy. And there have to be supports that allow and enable the, those aspects to take place. So the negative of it, if a, if, if a child grows up in a family where uh, the eating habits are, are poor, where they don't have access to good food or to healthy food, then of course that's going to affect that. On the other side, there's also a genetic aspect which says that if a, if a, if a parent has certain, well, put it this way, a parent has certain genes that are predisposed to uh, a child being overweight, then the child then mm. also has them. And trying to then overcome that can be a double whammy in terms of, you know, the parent has to eat well and in order for the child to eat well. So I'm not sure if that answered, but I think that the, it, it is a, a real challenge in, in a healthcare community to say how do we keep children healthy and how do we keep them um, within limits in terms of eating and exercise. There's also an aspect of the schools that um, our society anymore really does tend towards being um, more sedentary. So mm -hmm. computers, uh, if I look around my community, and I know there's a lot of kids in the community, you rarely see kids outside playing. Now, I don't think it's just a Texas thing because it's so hot out. But um, there, there has to be, there, there has become this, this trend towards a more sedentary society, and that really does play out in terms of the health of children and the health of adults. And it's a parents working thing too, isn't it? Parents as, as working, kids going to daycare, and maybe being somewhat active there, but not really getting out and walking and riding bikes and doing things that kids generally do that help them yeah. to stay. Let me follow shape. up, and then Lawrence, I know, wants to comment on this. Uh, I wanted to, you know, you know, as as we talk about this, though, does there need to be a paradigm shift in the way we think about parenting and children, though, Eileen, in, in, in around creating a healthy community from you know, blaming parents for not caring about their kids or, or blaming parents for not acting to make a better life for their kids and saying it's really, what is the community doing to help those parents? Does that have to happen? Well, certainly that, that helps. You know, when you talk about community, it, it, you have to be then very specific about what does that community involve. Yeah. So, uh, you know, is the community... Is it the neighborhood or the yeah, city or the state? Yeah, the neighborhood, the city, the state, whatever it might be. So, yeah, I mean, in the ideal world, that the community should be um, structured such that, that kids are out and doing things and, and active, uh, not just the parent. But at the same time, um, when we look at how busy, as you said, when we look at how busy people are, parents get home late, um, schools don't always have the best um, after after care hours, um, mm. there's all sorts of things that come into play. Parents are busy, the, the weekends are busy, um, and yet then there's the other side of the kids who are on the go all the time. They're in soccer, they're in baseball, they're in football, they're in all sorts of uh, activities. So it certainly does help to have it from a community perspective and communities that provide uh, activities certainly are better ones to be in than those who, where, you know, again, those And kids are in those activities when their neighborhoods provide yes. it, and many neighborhoods don't even provide exactly. those activities. Exactly, exactly. Lawrence, you wanted to comment? No, I'd, I'd add one quick thing, um, just making sure that the child is in the right place emotionally and psychologically to take advantage of all these supports that we build mm. um, for them. Um, can't tell you how many times um, we have a kid, I or the other doctors working at the Children's Assessment Center, um, have a kid that was in a maybe neglectful environment, they didn't have enough food. Um, all of a sudden, um, they go to maybe it's a really good foster home or they place with a really um, good relative um, that has the wherewithal and cares about them enough um, for that way they've got plenty of food, plenty of healthy food, uh, all that they could want in that way. But that kid still um, has poor eating habits. That kid hoards food. That kid binges. That kid um, does all kinds of things um, that are negative. Um, in terms for their body and for them emotionally in terms of their intake with food. Um, so that has to be addressed um, along with providing um, the things around them for them to take advantage of. But as long as that pattern of behavior um, is inside of that child, regardless of what you surround them with, um, you know, they're going to do what's inside of them. They have no choice. So us paying attention as we intervene to both sides 
working with that child and getting them in the right place psychologically um, to thrive, um, really in whatever environment, but also giving them things around them um, that are going to be conducive to that. Lawrence, uh, let me ask a, another question for you. Uh, last week, Mandy and I were with your boss, Elaine Stolte. We were at a lunch uh, for Ted Poe, Congressman Ted Poe. And one of the things he talked about was human trafficking. And, you know, Houston has become this big hub for human trafficking. And when we talk about human trafficking, uh, it's sort of a trendy issue, right? People are talking about it. And what a lot of people don't understand, I think most people probably don't understand, is that those victims, those trafficking victims, often started, let me say, that, almost always started as being sexually abused as children. And um, when you talk about some of the, the repercussions of those children that go through the Children's Assessment Center that have been uh, abused as children and, and what, how they become as adults, I mean, it's sort of striking, isn't it? I mean, maybe you could talk a little bit about that. Yeah, well, um, kind of along the same lines what I was talking about with the eating habits. Um, to the extent that certainly someone um, suffers some type of trauma um, and it um, is unprocessed, unworked through, it doesn't go away. I mean, it lives inside of that person. And it can manifest, of course, in all kinds of different ways. And one way could be being exploited um, sexually um, via prostitution, human trafficking, or something of that um, nature. So yes, many of the young men and young women um, that um, um, are victims um, of human trafficking um, do have some uh, traumatic history, sexual um, or otherwise, yeah. um, in their past. And so us addressing that really will um, um, go a long way toward uh, both prevention um, and just healing um, that individual. And I think another real big thing with the human trafficking, and I'm, I'm sure I'm amongst friends in this way in, in, in this setting, but, you know, um, sometimes terms like prostitution, um, those terms can be used when kids um, have been um, sexually abused. That's really making a point um, not to um, vilify um, the victim um, of abuse, you know, and call them a prostitute or call them some other negative term because they've been prostituted or trafficked or something like that. At the end of the day, that little girl may be a 13-year-old girl who sexually abused just like that other 13-year-old um, girl in terms of the actual, you know, definition of sexual abuse um, that maybe somebody abducts them um, on, but a lot of times we'll think of those things very differently. Um, the abuse, the trauma um, is the same. When we talk about, you know, child trafficking is, is very trendy. People are talking about it. All the TV shows or a lot of the TV shows are using that as our, our themes. Uh, and so it becomes easy to talk about, but still child abuse still seems to be something that people do not want to talk about. Uh, could you know, and as we talk about how do we end trafficking, we often say, well, you first stop, but stop, start by ending uh, child sexual abuse, and that, that, that's the beginning to ending trafficking. If we were going to try to end child abuse, what, would parenting classes very early on have a significant impact in your mind on ending some of the child abuse? Hey, I, I do very much believe uh, training um, of all kinds of people in the community, but certain, certainly parents um, can go a long way um, toward handling any issues um, related um, to abuse um, for just the reasons that members of the panel and you have outlined mm -hmm. um, already. It's not uh, a comfortable topic to think about um, a child um, having been sexually abused, much less sexually abused by somebody that they know, maybe by their, maybe by their father, maybe by their mother. Um, what about an infant that gets sexually abused? Um, those things even happen. And you know, you, you shy, I mean, it's hard, even with what I do, sometimes it's, it's hard to even get your mind around what can happen. And you, you do want to avoid it, you know, protect yourself from those feelings that it stirs up um, in you. But as you're doing that, of course, you're distancing yourself from having the knowledge that you need to um, address the problem and keep your children and the children around you safe. So more trainings um, and more conversations, even informal conversations, that do incorporate some discussion of this and some knowledge about what to do if you think a child um, has been abused. How do you report it? Um, why should you report it? Um, what are some of the signs and symptoms of a kid who, who's been abused? But really taking the time to do that and not just taking the time to do that after a child's been mm. abused, 
um, which we do a lot of those trainings. But boy, we love it when we have an opportunity to go to talk to somebody before something bad has happened. And that goes back to what Alvin was saying. Be, being proactive, we're going to save money down the line. But more importantly, we're going to save the lives of many a child. Mandy, we've talked about uh, childhood obesity. Uh, we've talked about trafficking. The state legislature, which is about to convene again in January, uh, as long as it doesn't cost money, they've been very supportive of things in terms of changing nutrition in the schools, in terms of banning the vending machines in the schools. Uh, and we've seen state legislatures across the country do similar things. In terms of trafficking, we've seen a couple of states really lead on laws against traffickers. And so we find that state legislat legislatures are acting around these things. What can we expect uh, in the near future around parenting and parenting issues? Anything? Uh, I mean, is this something that we have to chip away a lot at? I definitely think it's something that we need to chip away at. Uh, I, the state does not shy away from requirements or expectations if you're receiving benefits from the state. So mm -hmm. if um, WIC or TANF, um, the workforce, child care subsidies, I mean, we have um, strict regimented expectations on, on what parents um, need to fulfill. I think on the good side of things, if we want to be optimistic, I know that the state, the Department of State Health Services just launched a parenting campaign a few months ago. So the fact that they're recognizing that um, parenting, education, um, parent, have you seen the billboards? Some of y'all might have seen billboards that are around Houston and, and Dallas. It's parenting is hard, asking for help isn't necessarily. So that's a great step in the right direction, but then we have to ask ourselves, where are those parenting programs? Do these families have access to parenting programs? And currently, the state has 1% or a little bit less than 1% of evidence-based parenting. Um, so the state could move forward in um, tapping in. I'm looking at what other states are doing around parenting. There's federal funds, there's SAMHSA grants um, and other federal uh, grants that you could streamline into de Texas to fund parenting classes. Um, but the reality is, I don't know, the reality is um, starting in January, solutions that they're going to be looking at is not going to have a big fiscal note. So I think that it's very important for the communities to work together and raise awareness so that if it doesn't happen this session, um, we're still taking a step in the right direction and hopefully it can be addressed the next session. Alvin, uh, staying along that subject, you and I are editors of the Journal of Family Strength and so we see what's happening around the country. I mean, any ideas that you see happening around the country around parenting that that you think may be catching fire? Or, or are you less optimistic than, say, Mandy is around uh, legislative action and parents? Uh, well, I think we have to stay optimistic in it. If you don't do it this session, next session, and, and look for that window of opportunity even with the legislature. Um, yeah, one model that uh, we looked at that was uh, funded, and unfortunately it was funded for five years. It had wonderful evidence-based success. But it, because it was prevention, I think it wasn't really carried out. And that's where, uh, kind of building on what Eileen was saying, you identify at-risk families. Now, in this case, they had to be rural, um, um, premature child, first generation uh, in this community, Hispanic, it was along the border. And then they were assigned a social worker, a case worker, with a very low, like a 1 to 15 caseload. And even though the mothers didn't have any uh, presenting problems, that you could look down the line and see where there might be problems and where children might be at risk. So it included helping the mothers to in, in initiate and engage different agencies to get resources, help them build a network and not be isolated, help them with the uh, pre-K in that state, uh, and then get engaged in the school system. So that really reduced the rate of child abuse and then the need of those parents, usually single mothers, uh, of engaging more social services and incurring more costs to the taxpayer. So I think there are different programs out there. It's, and I think the technology is available for keeping families together and 
correctly parenting and, and working with children in a lot of different environments with a lot of different behaviors, uh, the <coughs> issue has really been getting the funding and implementing. Alvin, a question for you and for Lawrence, and then in, and Mandy and Eileen, you guys can feel free to answer as well. Uh, we have a former Children at Risk staff member who currently works in the Obama White House, and one of her issues is fatherhood issues. And she's the sort of the director of that campaign. When we talk about, you know, especially today as we've talked about parenting, uh, even in the keynote this afternoon, the, the, during lunchtime, we talked about moms and maternal leaves, and, and it seems like we're not talking sometimes enough about the role of fathers. I mean, what can we, what, what should we be doing around fatherhood issues? Uh, well, that's an excellent point, and uh, one of our keynote speakers tomorrow is going to be uh, leading that <laughs> educational process in Texas because fathers are critical to families. Um, the, and whether they're in the home or not, they, uh, the role model and the children's identification and as particularly males grow up and learn to um, be fathers, it's very critical. So I, I would agree that we really need to pay more attention to that. Over the years in this conference, we've really struggled to find uh, speakers, let alone programs, and, and the, the Department of uh, Family and Protective Services, I think, is doing a pretty good job in Texas of at least funding that educational uh, process, and we'll see that tomorrow. Lawrence, it seems like when government gets involved in fatherhood, it's all about deadbeat dads, but it, that's, not, that's not really the issue, is it? I mean, it's a lot more than that, way more. Uh, no, and I, I think, you know, one, one thing is, is really embracing and acknowledging how central and key um, it is for there to be a male presence um, in a child's life. Um, whether that child be a little girl or a little boy or a teenage girl or a teenage boy, the extent that that male presence um, and could be a father, but some positive male presence is there, it just makes a tremendous difference, really no matter what variable um, we look at. And so with that being the case, yeah, a little less emphasis on, um, you know, a deadbeat dad or a father who doesn't want to be part of a child's life, and more emphasis on helping those fathers who do want to be part of a child's life, um, helping them do that, um, putting supports in place to help them do that. I um, mean, also putting um, supports and, and um, um, systems in place to help identify um, secondary male figures um, who could be um, essential part, parts of children's lives. Um, sometimes these kids, you all, who are um, abused and you really get to talking to them in psychotherapy and, and, and you, 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 know, you get down to really the meat of, of what's going on, you know, they're searching for, maybe they're searching for a male figure that they didn't have in their life. Um, and somebody's used that to exploit them. They could be searching for a female figure that they didn't have in their life either. But when one of those two things, either one, um, is absence, absent, it makes a child a lot more vulnerable to a lot of things that could hurt them. Um, it doesn't give them the best chance of succeeding. Um, so, and I think we do as a society uh, sometimes err on the side um, of putting the, the limited resources we have um, into um, enhancing the ability of a maternal figure to be in that child's life. And hey, that's essential, no doubt. But, but the male figure is essential too. Mm -hmm. I mean, we gotta put a little more emphasis and energy into that. Eileen, any comments on that that you wanted to make? Or? All I'll say is, is just support what, what both guys have said and say that there, there are studies that show that the, the effect of the father and, and the male figure, I'll say father, a male figure in a female's uh, daughter's um, development is really important. So the, the, the female, the, the daughter, or the young, young woman who has a father who is loving and supportive and um, accepting of that person has a better uh, chance to be also uh, show those same kinds of uh, characteristics to others. And, and the negative of that is when the, the woman grows up or a young girl grows up with a a father who is um, abusive or um, constantly putting them down, self-esteem and all of those things are very much tied into that. And um, even if there is a strong mother in the, in the picture, that input, the negative input from a father is very, um, has a great effect on that child. So, and then as I talked about in, 
in my talk and, and brought up this, the ACE study, the, um, the, the adverse childhood events, and how those if adverse events then cause um, that there's such a greater, uh, a greater percentage of adults who have these multiple adverse childhood events who then suffer from physical and psychological um, problems. And so anyway, all of those things come into play. On, um, on Father's Day, uh, Marcus, I mean, uh, Lawrence, in terms of what you were saying, on Father's Day, Fox News called me and said, can we get an interview for you to talk about the impact of dads on children? And I talked about the positive impact of fathers, and immediately people were tweeting me, like, what about moms? And I'm like, well, no, I don't want to diminish moms at all, right, ever, but it was Father's Day, and so I was supposed to talk about fathers. But it's interesting, well, we don't want to diminish moms, but dads are important. And this is another interesting tidbit bit in the way of the research, um, and just to the research you were referencing, quality of time um, spent um, with a male figure um, seems to control a lot of the variance in terms of studies we're doing in a, in a positive way in terms of kids' response to time spent with fathers or male figures. Quality of time as opposed to quantity um, of time spent. So I think, um, I think sometimes maybe even uh, male figures might think, well, you know, does it really make a difference if I just go out there and um, have, um, have dinner? Um, with my son, spend a few hours with him. I can't spend the whole weekend for whatever reason. Well, research would indicate that yes, that short amount of time makes a tremendous difference um, in that child's um, life. And of course, more time wouldn't be bad, but for us all not to underestimate um, the central importance of some time um, being spent. Um, and then if you can get more than that, all the better. Yeah. Or, oh, go ahead. If, no. if I could follow up on that sure, from a, sure. more of a macro perspective, too. I think when you look at certain cultures where we've really emancipated men in that culture and we have 50% unemployment, you know, for African American men between, I think, 19 and 26, and we send more African American men to prison than we send to college, and when we cut Pell grants and financial aid that would enable uh, young men. To, to go to school that have been uh, coming from uh, lower economic class, we have to see that there is an impact on child maltreatment as well. Because it's, you know, if you don't have your self esteem and if society takes that away from you and your station in life is of, of that ilk, then that impacts on how well you can uh, serve as a role model for the children. So I think when we, even talk about student financial aid, we need to follow that through and think about how does that impact on uh, children and, and particularly uh, male status in the family. You're not sounding like a conservative anymore now, Alvin. <laughs> hey, uh, Mandy, I wanted to ask you, um, uh, we were gonna have Matt Barnes on this panel, he was not able to make it, and he was gonna talk about the impact of parents and education. I wonder if you might talk about it. We know that for families historically in the United States, uh, the way that children have moved from one economic class to another has been through quality education, a quality public education. You know, what is the importance of parents in making sure that those kids are, are getting those, that education and that parents are advocates for their children? Sure, that, obviously it's extremely important, right? Um, School is where we send our kids for eight, nine hours a day. That is where, um, that's who is raising our children a lot of times, not completely, but have a huge influence where they're staying there more than their time at home. So it's extremely important for parents to be educated on what's available to their kids, to have expectations, to be advocates for their families, particularly, um, in general, but also particularly with um, low-income families, right? If you look at the school system and you look at what those schools are providing your kids, you have to ask yourself, is that enough? Is that, I want, is that what I want for my child? And if not, then be able to go and seek the resources that need to happen. So I'm sure Matt Barnes, Families Empowered, that's what they do. They help families, especially in low-income areas, who want to get into those great charter schools, who want to get into that KIPP or that YES because their school or school district, they're not satisfied with it. Well, those schools have 
8,000 people waiting to enter it. So are there any other options? Um, and so that's what Families Empowered is to empower them on what do you want for your family and how can you ensure that your, ch your child or your children um, will be academically successful. Andy, how, with so many families, and you mentioned it, in, in Texas and in so many of the southern tier states that uh, have such high, especially young families, high levels of poverty, uh, high level, high level, well, low levels of educational attainment by the part of the parents. So not a lot of influence, not a lot of educational attainment. The very indicators that say that those families are less likely to be involved in the educational success of their children. How do we make that transition of getting those same parents? We want those kids to be successful. How do we get those parents to be better education advocates for their kids? Well, I think that they need to be empowered. They need to feel like they have a voice. So we all agree that education is really important to our kids. We know that early education is especially important. It's laying down the foundation for our children. However, when we look at Austin and we look at what happened last session, they cut $5.4 billion from the education system. Pre-K was, was slashed. Many school districts aren't offering full-time pre-K or they cut their, their programs down. So I think that it's very important that parents feel like they have a voice in advocating for their kids. Children don't have a voice. And so they have the stories, they can deliver the message and it's really important that they do so. Thanks, Mandy. Uh, let's open it up to questions from you guys. What questions do you guys have for our esteemed panel? Let me, I'll just take one question and then I'll finish up. If you just, just someone come up with one question. Wow. You guys, okay, not helping me out. Okay, if you guys, briefly, and let's start with you, Lawrence. Uh, if you had to change one public policy, and we did this earlier at lunch, uh, around parenting in the state of Texas, what policy would you change? And then let's go across. Do you want Mandy to start? Come back to you? She's got one ready. I don't know, but. <laughs> She's a public policy person, so I'm just, yeah, I'm just assuming. Yeah, yeah. You need to go deep into the depths of your brain to come up. What do you, what do you got, Mandy? What, what, so, what would you change? So thinking big, ideally, we would have parenting as a priority for the state. We would prioritize it by funneling um, funds into evidence-based parenting, the end, ideally. That's what we would like to see to help support our parents. Um, and we're trying to do that with Medicaid, aren't we, with uh, trying to get uh, the state to make that sort of a policy, the whole Right, evidence. so right now, um, the 1115 Medicaid waiver, some of you may be... Um, may know that we are really redesigning the de the health delivery system, delivery of the health system, so physical and mental health. And so there are a lot of interested key stakeholders who are trying to get parenting, evidence-based okay. parenting into that plan. Eileen, what would be the one public policy that you would want to change here in the state of Texas or in the United States? Well, I, I think health care, and again, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good at knowing like the numbers, you know, like the, the sure. actual policy, but I think from a health care perspective, since that's kind of what I do, I'm really so supportive and, and concerned about what's going to be happening with um, the Affordable Care Act. I'm not sure whether it's a you know, you hear all sorts of things. Is it going to be helpful? Who's going to pay for it? All of those things. But I think no matter what, what I see is just in general for people who do not have health care insurance, access to health care is really difficult. Mm. So I would love to see that people, I wish, if I wish there was a good way to pay for it where, you know, we had the money to pay for it. But even here at UHD, most of the students that I see don't have health insurance. And getting access to care is so difficult for them from anywhere from mental health issues to physical issues to surgery to whatever it might be. So if I, I really am hopeful that um, that, that does change. I, I'm not supportive of a one-payer system as, as we have in Canada, but somehow I, I'm just supportive of wanting to see better health care availability to people who at this point don't have it. Very good. Alvin, one policy. And we're allowed to dream big. You could yeah. dream big, absolutely. I, I think we have to make it in this country where people have an adequate uh, income to live where they don't have to have three jobs. 
so they can spend time with their children. Well, now you've gone to communist, Alvin. Now you're just like... <laughs> <laughs> but right, uh, applause on that one, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> we get that, that parents have time to be parents and that we support uh, them financially so that they don't have to have three jobs, go to school full time, and, and parent three children. And that's the reality of most of my students at UHD. Yeah. It, it, and we don't talk about poverty enough in this country, do we? I mean, it's, it's interesting that no one wants to talk about it, but one of the best public policies to eliminate poverty is really just raising the minimum wage, and no one really wants to talk about that. Um, anyway. Lawrence, what do you got? I haven't had a chance to think a little bit. Um, I, I think I'm all for any early childhood intervention. You know, that ECI used to be a, mm. an acronym that, you know, you'd see all the time because right. there were all these programs geared toward going. It's and almost gone family. now in terms of budget Yeah, cuts. you don't hear it anymore. Yeah, yeah. yeah one of the things that's been cut. So anything in the way of um, health care, early intervention, but especially mental health care. I mean, as we look at all of those people that we're putting in the prison, all of those people in our, uh, not all of them, but many people, um, in our prisons, many people, um, um, in our juvenile justice system, many times there, there's some form of uh, mental illness um, associated um, with um, their functioning, um, and that is playing some role, other than them just being a bad person, um, and them ending up um, incarcerating, and co incarcerating and costing our society that much more money to care for them, maybe throughout the course of their lifetime. Um, intervening early, um, recognizing some of these problems when you're dealing with a three or four year old there than a 30 or 40 year old um, there's still a lot of chance there and a lot of hope there um, to change that person and make them a productive member of society um, rather than a, a prison inmate so any early childhood intervention but especially um, around uh, mental health services very good Alvin, uh, what do you do every Monday between uh, 3 and 4 uh, in the afternoon? What is it that you do every Monday? I uh, usually run errands or great papers so I can listen to the radio and learn about growing up in Houston. And so uh, yesterday America. I was... America. Growing up America, in America. Sorry. I'm trying to grow up in Houston first. Uh, and yesterday, which was Tuesday, I eagerly awaited for the program to come on and then realized that uh, Labor Day, I missed it. So That's right. That's right. <laughs> even and yesterday, we were preempted I was on Labor Day anyway. But every Monday between three and four, ninety point one, or you could also go to iTunes. You hear "Growing Up in America." Mandy and I are the co-hosts of a show just talking about children's policy every week, and we have great guests like this on the program. Alvin loves to listen. Al Eileen, you listen a lot too. Yeah, yeah, you do. You tell me how good Mandy is all the time. Yeah, I don't know about me, but you like Mandy, so. Listen, give our audience, uh, our uh, group a big hand here, guys.